I think we're just about ready to get started. So everybody that's on here with us, thank you so much for joining us today. And like always, I hope wherever you are in the world, you're doing really well. Um, if you haven't joined us before, welcome. I'm Jen Kearney. I'm the Digital Communications Manager here at McLean Hospital. During this session, um, Dr. Coyne and I are going to talk about validating fearful emotions in both adults and kids and how to reframe anxiety to make the pandemic ups and downs a challenge that's easier for really all of us to overcome. It's been a hard time for kids, but you know, that uncertainty that's around, it's been really tough for adults too. Um, and then last but not least, before I turn it over to Lisa, if you aren't familiar with her already, she's a psychiatrist and senior clinical consultant here. Psychologist. Oh, <laughs> this is why I, I don't prescribe, but uh, this, is why, okay. this is why I can't have nice things. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa is a psychologist and senior clinical consultant at the Child and Adolescent OCD Institute at McLean, otherwise known as OCDI Junior. And Lisa, before I try to put my foot in my mouth one more time, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick it off, and then we can get started on the questions. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. And it's nice to have you guys join us again. Um, and I just wanted to kind of start by acknowledging everybody who is working really, really hard, whether you're at home whether you're an essential worker, whether you are a frontline healthcare worker, especially if you're working in mental health, um, we know you're there and we feel you. And just thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing. We are, everyone is grateful. Um, so just to start with that. And then since the topic today is on anxiety and coping with it, I think it's probably useful to know that the vast majority of us at some point in our lifetime will, if we have not already, experience some clinically meaningful anxiety. You know, it's almost one in two, right? So when you think about that, this is ubiquitous. This is something we all struggle with. And in fact, it's a necessary part of our being human. It's a part of our evolutionary history. It's part of our nature. Um, we can talk a lot about how it works and things like that. And then what do we do with it? when all of us are experiencing sort of, as, as Jen so you know, beautifully said, um, uncertainty and uh, an uncertain length of time with this contextual chronic stressor that we have. And if you're a parent, I you know that you're probably anxious now about how do I protect my kids and how do I help support them especially if you are struggling with your own anxiety about this. And it's, it, would be, you would, it would be strange if you weren't feeling anxious about this. Yeah, I think that's actually, you know, that teases off the first question really nicely. Um, most people wanna know, like, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm incredibly uncertain. So how do I get that point across to my kids without getting them more worked up, without getting me more anxious because, you know, kids think their parents know everything. So what happens when we don't have the answer and how do we confidently relay that we don't know the answer? I don't have the answer to that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I think <laughs> that's a really important question. And we never really can see the future, right? We kind of are good as, you know, because we're humans and because we're language and creatures, we're really good at thinking abstractly and at projecting our predictions for the future into the future. And anxiety, you know, especially if you're a worrier, right, is all about those what if worries that project you into the future. Um, so I think one of the first things I think that will be helpful is having good communication about anxiety. I think that sometimes we can be frightened to talk about these things because we think, oh my goodness, I must hide my anxiety from my kids. I have to not talk about this. I don't want talk about it to make them focus on it or make them anxious about it. And, and I apologize in advance, you're gonna hear dogs barking because COVID work from home, I'm very sorry. Hope some of you at least have dogs out there. They're a great tool when you're anxious. And at least one of these dogs has been a therapy dog at McLean. So there you go, anyway. Where was I? So I think it's really important to be able to have good and accepting communication about anxiety. And the degree to which it creates anxiety in the kids is gonna really 
be a function of, you know, two things. One is how do you talk about it yourself? And do two, is your kiddo very, very sensitive to anxiety? And so individual families and individual, um, you know, parents are going to have to think about what works best for them. But the first thing is, you know, when I, I'll tell a little story to kind of illustrate this. So when I was first learning to give talks, I used to have massive panic attacks <laughs> and actually avoided talking and, you know, doing any sort of public speaking um, because it was just so anxiety provoking, right? And the thing that I learned was the more I avoided it, the harder it got, right? And the less willing I was to do it. So at some point I started to say yes to these kinds of things. And that was years ago. But one of my tools that I did when I was first learning how to give talks while anxious was to let people know, you know, I feel pretty anxious right now. And actually, I think I might have a panic attack. And I'm just going to let you know that. And it sounds so counterintuitive. But if you model that you can feel anxious, which is a normal human emotion, and also function, empathize, connect with your kiddos, that's gonna send them a really powerful message about self-efficacy and resiliency, right? Sometimes the more we treat a normal human response like stress or anxiety in the face of COVID, like a toxic thing that we have to manage, mitigate, make go away, the more of a hold it has on our imagination and our mental bandwidth, right? So what I would encourage you guys to do is think carefully about this, right? And then mindfully kind of experiment a little bit with like, you know, well, I'm just feeling stressed today and it's okay. And sometimes when I'm stressed, I go take a walk or I snuggle with my dog or, you know, sometimes I ask for help and it's okay, you know? So have, having kind of a loose um, idea and so for those of you who have kids with anxiety, um, that's especially important for them, right? Because that may not be a skill set that they have. I think it's super important. Go. Yeah, I think that's really important to be able to validate the full spectrum of emotion and feeling yeah. because, you know, it's, it's like you had said last week, if you just acknowledge the feeling and then like work through it, breathe your way out of it, you're going to be able right. to overcome it faster. And then you have right. that skill that you can better maintain it in the future. And I think, exactly. yeah, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, so what happens if it's, you know, a parent feels like they're sort of the middleman between generations? Um, yeah, that's mostly, a good one. mostly because I, I know as being... <laughs> the daughter of somebody who didn't totally understand the severity of it at first. Now they're understanding uh -huh. it a little bit more, but this generation of being the middleman, especially if you live locally to your family um, and they don't really understand the severity of it yet. How do you lower that anxiety for a multi-generational family, especially if they're all under the same roof? Yeah, I think it's really tough. And I think, um, you know, having really good communication about the actual risks that's accurate and, you know, is, is important and it may need to be a repeated conversation. And so I know I was telling Jen last week that I had to chat with my mom about not sneaking out to the grocery store when we could bring her stuff and that was our whole function um, and having some anxiety about that myself. So I think the thing to remember is that it's not going to be a one-shot conversation. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and I think when you have to say hard things to people, right, where it's difficult to get people to, to really hear you and understand, one way to think about it is to have what we might call values and vulnerabilities conversation. And this is something from acceptance and commitment therapy that I learned long, long ago. And basically the ingredients are what's most important to you and what is the vulnerability that you might find hard to express or that shows up for you. And so one, so you could, here's an example. You could say, you wow. know, mom or dad or aunt or whoever the elderly person is or the immunocompromised person who might be at risk in your house. I care about you a lot. I care about your safety you are our family and we love you. 
And it's really important to me. I'm really scared that I want to make sure that I can do what's possible to keep you and everyone else in the family safe. And I feel like I'd really like to have a conversation with you about how we can do that together, you know? And those pieces, I think, and coming at it from the heart of the issue, right, is, is a hard conversation to have because for those of us who aren't super comfortable sharing emotions, right, and there's a whole, you know, there's variability in that. That can be tough, but it's also really powerful and it's effective at helping you get your point across. And so the same is true for kids. So if you have younger children and they want to go and visit, you know, hopefully they're all at home and, you know, doing their social distancing and doing things safely and not having play dates as has been advised, right? In Massachusetts, at least, you know, kind of having, helping them be mindful about how they're interacting with the older person, et cetera, who may or may not be in or out of the house. Um, and then finally, Here's the hard thing. You know, if you do have an adult person in your house, they are an adult and they are going to make their own decisions. And there's really very little that we can do to control the actions of others. But what you can do is speak authentically and consistent with what's important to you, what's most important to you, to that person and send your message. And that may go farther than you think. Or so we hope. Yeah, I think the yeah, I think, you know, speaking with that vulnerability and authenticity, it's something that everybody can learn to have a little bit more empathy for one another and, you know, better understand where people are coming from in this time that it doesn't, while you are afraid for your loved ones, it doesn't have to come mm. across as being fearful messaging itself exactly. and expressing those. It doesn't have to be um something that'll frighten them to keep them from going out of the house. But yeah, no, I think that's super yeah. helpful. Um, exactly. So what happens if the family is fragmented? So I'm talking like joint custody. That's a good kids, question. Kids have to go back and forth. There's parents, step siblings. Um, if you don't have a good conversation with your ex-partner or a good relationship rather with your ex-partner, how do you talk to your kid about it? How could you approach the conversation with your ex-partner about it? Such a good, a really important question. And I'm, you know, and I'm guessing this is about like, how do we set guidelines or adhere to guidelines for safety and visitation and all of those things? Exactly. And yeah. And I think this is a tough one. And I think that the same kind of conversation can be really helpful because if you have a fractious relationship with a partner or an ex-partner, you don't see eye to eye and everybody knows like, you know, not all parents see things equally. Even in my house, like I have my role, my husband has his role. We don't agree on all things, but we've learned over the years to kind of take turns and sign off to one or the other if one of us is better at something. And so I think you can get caught up in wanting to be right about something, winning an argument, that may or may not be helpful. So instead, you might think about an experiment with stepping back and thinking, what is the bigger picture here, right? Are you willing to have a collaborative arrangement with this other person that maybe you're struggling with in the service of keeping everybody safe? And are you willing to speak you know, and let go of the winning of an argument, maybe in the service of making a decision that is closer to what you would think is workable for your families um, to you know, stick to the guidelines that we are getting from the CDC and elsewhere to keep everybody safe. And are you willing to forgo visits, right? If that means that's a step towards in the long term keeping your family safety or safe, and then can you be flexible with how those visits are? Maybe you can have Zoom visits. Maybe there are fun things. There are all sorts of game kinds of things. There's ways you can visit online and they're not the same for sure, but in the situation, are they workable? And so I would encourage people to think about what's feasible, what's workable, 
And what can you let go of in the service of moving forward with a joint and collaborative agreement that people will stick to together to make it work for the extended family or the fragmented family? And I feel like that, you know, that application kind of ties into what I would ask you next is, you know, how do you keep, even if you have a close knit family, how do you keep that tension low and keep a more lighthearted atmosphere? Um, we did get, get a, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I could do that right now. <laughs> there have been a lot of adoptions and there aren't many dogs left, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, we got we got so many questions about how do I talk to my teen yeah. and actually be oh, you yeah. know bonding with them when every time I try to approach them I get shut down because I'm the uncool parent or I'm the uncool older sibling. So yeah. <laughs> not, That's not funny. That, yeah, we have that, that going have that on in our house. <laughs> <laughs> right. So just okay, so for parents of teenagers, I encourage you to think about this, right? Your teenagers are, you know, individuating again. They're in that developmental stage where we can construe it all as rebellion. And for some of it, it truly is for some of them. But for a lot of them, it's just a normal part of growing up, of finding their way in the world. And just think about like their days before COVID and their days now. So they may never see you <laughs> like pre-COVID. And now you're all within arm's reach. And while it's a wonderful opportunity to connect, they may treat you like you're like, you know, get away from me. Yeah, like you should be self-isolating even if uh, yeah, you're not like, exposed. Yeah, like, could you oh, please yeah. leave me alone? So um, I think what I would say to that is, again, this same kind of conversation that we've been talking about, values, vulnerability. Listen, I get, the, and, and do some really solid perspective taking. Put yourself in their shoes and just imagine. Also, connect in with your teen self. Remember, just give some thought to what were you like as a teenager? What would you have done had your parents wanted to like hang out with you all the time? Wow, right? I mean, I don't know. Mine wouldn't have loved that. But that's not to say that you can't create new COVID-specific family routines and family roles to help yourselves get through this that are workable for everyone, right? So Maybe it's a brief check-in in the morning. Maybe it's a brief check-in around a meal at nighttime. Maybe you ask for some help with a simple task, like can you chop the vegetables while I'm doing that? And you steal a few moments to check in and see. Um, again, you know, there are kids who will be struggling. And this is, I mean, there's going to be massive variability. And I know our listeners and, and the situations, because I work with you know, anxious kids and kids with OCD who may be seeking added support instead of wanting parents to go away. And so for that set of, of folks, we have to think about what's workable in terms of making sure that we're not, you know, feeding their weakness instead of their strength by accommodating all of the requests for reassurance versus encouraging them to handle things on their own and spacing out check-ins perhaps. You know, and also being supportive and empathic and all those things. So I think thinking about how can you meet each teenager or your teenager where they are? Having a conversation, inviting a conversation about like, you know, again, hey, I care about you. And this is, I feel like this is a weird situation and I don't really know how to talk to you. And I feel like we've not really even been in the same room for this much time in a really long time. And it's just a funny situation that we're finding ourselves in. Nonetheless, I want to connect with you. And do you think that there might be some way we could do that that's, that works for you? That's not super annoying. You know, and if you're really cool, maybe you ask them to teach you how to play that video game they're on. I still haven't crossed that boundary, just FYI, but it's getting close. Just give it I a don't couple, really want to learn how to play Minecraft, but I know. <laughs> Like, where are we all going with this? You never know. You're so. just the new esports <laughs> champion at the end of all of this. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> but I think that's so. that's a super important message too, because I know like I'm I'm not a parent. I don't have teenagers in the house, but it's you know, it's my husband and me, and we're both we were both workaholics. We'd see each other at the same gym, and then all of a sudden 
we'd like, we'd be home for dinner, but now all of a sudden I've been home for 45 days and he's actually self quarantining. Um, so, so it's been, you know, it was five weeks of seeing each other all the time. And that was a conversation we had to have too. Like, I care about, I care about you, but I never saw you. How do we, how do we bond together when neither one of us is leaving the house for weeks on end? And that was, it was an important conversation to have. Um, and thankfully we had it sooner than later. And he's been, you know, I work at McLean, so he's been really receptive to having these like open and authentic conversations. And he'll say, who did did you talk to at work about this? (laughs) It's It's been a, it's been a long time coming, but with that being said, you know, there are family members and it's been, you know, myself included now that he's self-quarantining, people are experiencing panic and anxiety, whether it's a high risk, a high risk group being exposed or having to be alone. Like Mm -hmm. he's been in a separate room for three days now and I'm a high risk group. So we've been having a roller coaster here ourselves. And, you know, I myself have tried what you had suggested last week of, going back to the present moment and drawing them back to the thought of I'm safe and I'm healthy right now. We're doing everything that we can. Mm -hmm. And this is something a bunch of other people have asked, you know, what other recommendations do you have? Because while that's a, that's something that you can learn, what other methods, yeah. What other methods can be effective if you've already drawn yourself into that? And then if you've learned it, can you just snap out of it easier? What else can we do? Yeah. So first things first, too, I want to say that some of our families I know may be really struggling with clinically meaningful anxiety. And what that means really is anxiety to the level that it, you find it impairing, like your function, um, your ability to really be present with the people that you care about, your ability to work if you're still working, um, your ability to succeed in school if you're, wor- if you're studying, etc., And so it is important to know that, you know, there are still therapists out there who are working. We are available. Um, There's many, many places that you can go. And most of the community has been working, um, you know, depending on what kind of therapist you are, in teletherapy. And data suggests that teletherapy is as effective as face-to-face therapy. And so you know, data has come out about that and there's people are making lots and lots of adaptations. So you may have some ideas about like, oh, you know, I've got to wait or this isn't going to work. And I would encourage you that if you do need help to reach out and try it, McLean is a great place and a great resource to start finding out information about that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, there are some different pieces that may be helpful with anxiety and one of the first ones is, as, as Jenna's mentioned, is practicing present moment awareness. Um, as we talked last week about how, you know, your minds are great at running into the future and predicting or going into the past and ruminating. And so being mindful, of where's your attention right now and bringing it to the present and grounding yourself in the present moment is is helpful so really noticing with your five senses what's going on and my favorite way to practice that is with someone else so that i can really be mindful of the people that i'm with Um, another thing that is useful is we can have very worried thoughts Um, you know i actually you know this weekend i was starting to really think about like when are we going to get out of this and like what if we don't get out of this and like this is really dangerous and also all those sorts of thoughts that i think are probably occurring for all of us more frequently um and so one of the things that i will do is i will step back and sort of notice that i am having that thought right and notice that when i'm having that thought I'm having a physiological response in my body. I might have an emotion that's attached to it and those are okay. But what I'll notice is that these are thoughts. These are not realities or truths. Um, And then I'll sort of watch that thought and be like, okay, so that was a scary thought that I just had right there. What's the next thought I'm going to have? You know, and I'll kind of just keep noticing, like the, in the same, I keep think, having this metaphor of like, you remember when um, we were all younger and people said you should count sheep to try and yeah. go to sleep? Yep. <laughs> so kind of like, 
you're like observing the thoughts pass across your horizon of your awareness. Um, and that is sometimes very, very helpful, right? The other thing too is that when you have a worried thought, the first thing that most of us, you know, think to do is I got to talk myself out of that thought or I need to push that thought out of my mind. And so let's do a little experiment right now and see how that works. So I want you to think about, let's make it a patchwork plaid elephant. Okay, when you have that patchwork plaid elephant, now I want you to make it go out of your mind so that there's no evidence of that element or of that elephant ever having been there. So Jen, you let us know when you're able to do that. You're really smart. I'm sure you can do this right away, right? Not She's exactly. Laughing. As soon as you, as soon as you say the word, it's like almost out. And then as soon as you say the word elephant, it's like right back in there. <laughs> yep. And but frankly, yeah, I, guess that I have, I have this problem all the time with the anxious thoughts. And like one thing that's helped me, and I know like you are the expert here, but one thing that's helped me is going into a pattern of then what questions. So if I think of, if I'm thinking of a worst Ooh. case scenario, then it, I have to prompt myself with then what, because if things keep happening after that, then it's the next worst case scenario. And eventually I've spiraled myself into, well, I guess I just have to pick up and start over. And if, and by ex kind of exhausting my anxious mm -hmm. thoughts and concerns, I've realized that it's not really as scary if I keep coming up with that's alternative brilliant. solutions. I love that. That's really good. And that's a really good example of the next tool, right? Because if the more, what you'll find guys, and if you haven't noticed this is try this, right? The more you try not to think about something, the more you think about it. Cause you kind of have to hold it in your mind to make sure you're not thinking about that thing, right? It's like trying to push a beach ball under the waves. It's going to keep popping up. The better thing to do would be like, I am having a thought and I do not like it. And I am having all sorts of things. And that thoughts linked to as Jen has just kind of, you know, described all sorts of other things and then what and then this will happen right and what she in that example that really nice example the strategy that she did was she didn't push it away at all in fact she invited it in and that's the next tool is you don't have to accept the reality but accepting that you're having a thought that you don't like that's triggering that's very different and that's a practice that you can develop over time so that's the third that's the second thing third thing is and this is an important one. Anxiety is going to show up for all of us. And you can spend your time and focus your energy on managing that anxiety. Or you can choose a different intention. Right? So to go back to this example of giving talks while anxious. When I got better at this, what I would do is I would walk out. And I would start to feel all the makings of a panic disorder or a panic uh, attack happening. And I'd be like, oh no, here it comes again, oh no. And um, I would worry about people seeing it and all this. And then I would pause. And I would ask myself this one simple question. What are you up to right now? Right? Are you working on trying not to be anxious or are you here do you want to focus on giving this talk the best that you can? And just that one simple question gave me a choice. I can try and manage this, or I can choose something that's more important than this and do that instead. Right? So if you're a parent and you're really panicking, you're really worried about things, you can pause, notice what you're up to and choose we call it pause notice choose right pause notice am i trying to push away this thought or feeling is that fruitful or do i want to choose something different right and try it see how it works for you but that's something that is a very helpful strategy that's you know, I'm just going to incorporate that into my everyday life. So that's what I, <laughs> I do it all the time too. So it's like, you know, yeah, I think, I think it's been, you know, this stuff is super valuable for parents, but it's also been super valuable, you know, just for somebody who 
might be feeling more anxiety than normal or experiencing anxiety for the first time because of this and not really knowing. I mean, my husband said, you know, I've got chest tightness. I feel kind of dizzy. My heart rate's up. Um, I said, how's your breathing? He goes, I, he goes, you know, shallow. And I said, do you think maybe that's anxiety? And he was just had no, had no idea that that was the phenomenon. So it's been, it's been a small exercise here of the then what and walking him through all of that. So it's been, you know, actually, you know what, and that makes me think of something else that's really helpful along with your then what idea is for people who, you know, a lot of us walk around and we're kind of like, you know, we experience, not everyone experiences anxiety the same way. Okay. Depending on your culture, depending on how you were raised, depending on how you talk about it and what you notice. For some of us, we experience it all as physical symptoms. Okay. So one of the things that can be really helpful is if you're starting to feel tense, tightness, shortness of breath, all of those things, slow yourself down and break that down and spend a little time paying attention to each part of your body that's feeling like it's uncomfortable. Okay. And really notice and kind of ask yourself, well, what is this? You know, is this, just notice the, the sensation. Okay. Because there's the sensation and then there's what we think about the sensation. And the former is probably not a big deal. But the latter, those scary thoughts you may have about them may be what amps it up. And I know for in our house, my daughter will ask me like, she'll just text and be like, my chest is really tight. And I know she's worried about, oh God, am I sick, right? And so noticing there's two pieces, there's three pieces really to anxiety. There's the feeling, there's the physiological sensation, and then there's what you think about it and what you make of it. So breaking that all down so you kind of get what the experience is can be really helpful and just understanding it a little better. So with the physiological manifestation of all of this anxiety and fear, how do you address when kids aren't sleeping well? So when there's, you know, recurring nightmares or kids getting up and and landing in their parents' bed in the middle of the night, or just really, you know, going through sleep regression or just crying before they go to bed, Mm -hmm. um, you know, assuming part of it's just being exacerbated by the fact that they're exhausted and they're not sleeping well, how do you, how do you support them? Do you start incorporating naps? Do you encourage a relaxation routine? You know, what would, what would your advice be? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a whole range of things that happen. And some of these things, you know, will genuinely need, you know, intervention by somebody who actually is a pediatric sleep, you know, behavioral health person. Um, But I think that sleep disruptions, just given that all aspects of our schedules and structures have, you know, have changed are going to be more common now than they were in the past. And we do deal with a number of these kinds of things in our clinic. So a few tips that can be helpful in general, right, at baseline. Um, Jen's 100% correct that like, in, in terms of managing anxiety, first medicine is going to be basics, like eating well, sleeping well, etc, right, getting exercise. But for sleep, Routines can be very, very helpful, okay? So trying to stick to a sleep routine is going to be um, a tool that's gonna be one of your first ones that you think about. Making space for little regressions, like, you know, I think kids are really good at reading anxiety levels in a home. And so if parents are feeling more anxious, kids are feeling more anxious too, you know? That's an important thing to notice. So I think making a space and being gentle with some of these things for now and not necessarily picking that battle because helping the kids get good sleep is gonna be foundational for maintaining kind of lower anxiety levels um, at home. So that's a couple of things to do. A Couple more things that are gonna be important. Think carefully about how much COVID related information and stressful stuff is available and on tap around the house, whether it's a TV, whether it's on, you know, some other live stream, Facebook, whatever else is going on. I think really think carefully about that because even for adults, having a constant connection to news and um, all the stuff that's going on in the world can be exhausting. 
and it's not necessary. So think carefully about that. Screen use, turn it off at least an hour before bedtime. Very, very important. Caffeine, chocolate, it's not sugar. There's, there's no data linking sugar to bedtimes. And I know a bunch of you are gonna go, but there is, I know, I disagree. <laughs> Caffeine, however, is a totally different story. Um, so limiting things with caffeine um, after dinner. Okay, really important. Save those chocolate chip cookies for the lunchtime snack. Um, like right before they need to actually study something on, on a screen, <laughs> that might be helpful for you. Um, but definitely not doing that. Give them a nice nighttime snack. That's a non-caffeinated, chocolate-fied thing. Um, and then have a bedtime routine where you have a check-in. Um, and I think things like that would be helpful to get things started. I think that's super helpful, you know, and again, it's something that while it's applicable to kids, we can all learn something from it, that whether, especially if you're having a problem sleeping. And one more thing, this is something that often comes up with teenagers. So I think last time we talked about the sleep phase shift that happens for teens, where it's normal for them to go to bed a little bit later and get up a little bit later, but it is possible for them to get into a spin where they're staying up all night gaming and then they're not getting up till late in the day. And that is actually a bigger deal. It's, it's, is it a big deal right now? Probably not because there's, you know, if they're doing school, it's probably something that they can do unless they have a structured scheduled class, but it will contribute to difficulties transitioning back to regular life, okay? And so if you can anchor bedtime by, please get up at this time in the morning, I would do that rather than fight about um, what time bedtime happens. But I would make it harder to sleep past a certain hour in the morning um, by, you know, the normal noises of the household, the normal lights get on, things like that, um, et cetera. And then setting up routines and schedules um, for things to do in the morning. Like I know, for example, like we have school in the morning, we have get up, do this stuff, and then you can have your afternoon for gaming, and then you come to dinner, and we talk, we hang out at dinner, and then you have your downtime, but we really expect you to be in bed, and we're not going to police that, but we are going to make sure you get up early in the morning, so the natural consequence of staying up super late is going to be not so pleasant, so that's one way you can use a structure in a way that is less effortful than getting into big battles over what time to go to bed, that can be helpful for parents of teens. So you have basically set me up for the next question because it's <laughs> about it's about parents and teens. Shocking okay. that. So we've got a bunch of healthcare providers on here. We've got a bunch of first responders and essential workers. And first and mm. foremost, before I jump into the question, thank you for everything that you're doing. Me saying thank you truly isn't mm. enough, but really thank you so much for keeping all of us safe so that I can do these for my house safely mm. protected. You know, we really appreciate that. Um, but with that being said, you know, there are te there are parents of teens who are going out to work every day. And, you know, a lot of these teens are coming across not thinking that their parents are taking all the right precautions or necessarily doing everything to keep their own family safe. So how can these people have positive reinforcement in their household that they are doing all the right things and taking all the right measures? Yeah. And I think that's a hard one because we all know that you can have a conversation and say all the right things and also it cannot be heard by your teenager. And so I think one thing you might consider is making a space to let the teen have that, you know, honor how they're feeling. You can reassure them only so much and that reassurance will or won't but make a space for it to be a little bit uncomfortable in the time being and empathize with them, especially if they're on the anxious side. That can be really, really hard and really, really triggering. Um, don't take, if there is upset and yelling and things like that, as a parent, I would not take that stuff personally. You know, everybody says things that they regret when they are at their most stressed. So that is not something that, you know, I think in the future, kids will mean. I think it's something that they may come back around and apologize for. So that's really important. Um, yeah. That's, I think that's incredibly helpful. And it's a gentle reminder 
too that you know even if they're not a teen everybody says those yeah. things that they don't mean when they're stressed and even if there isn't an apology you know that it was something that wasn't sincerely said so yeah. definitely definitely important um and one other thing too to mention is i think we said this last week too timing really matters so the height of emotion is not generally the best time people can't hear you right they can't take in information um and so walking away from fights in a kind way like i understand you're really upset and it is not okay for you to speak to me like this right now i am happy to discuss with you later okay i'm gonna walk away now when you're calm feel free to come find me you know and they kids may or may not like that and that's okay too but setting some kind and firm boundaries when you're at the height of emotion is going to diffuse further conflict or escalation of conflict. And that's going to be really, really important. That's, yeah, super helpful. Um, what if somebody is on the front lines and they're, you know, they're exposed to all of not only the mm -hmm. virus, but all this information? How do they decrease their own worry and knowledge? How do they keep their families from being affected by it. And certainly, you know, there is concern about there being long-term trauma as a result of this constant ongoing exposure, but what are some methods to maybe, you know, reducing that at least short-term effect? So again, I want to emphasize like how, how hard it must be to be, you know, working with COVID patients, if you have direct care of COVID patients, um, and also even if you're an essential worker elsewhere, putting yourself at risk out of necessity, that's really hard. And I think the first thing to do is to really meet yourself where you are. It is hard and you are seeing hard things. And, you know, Allowing yourself, you're going to have to do what you're going to have to do to get through the situations of acute stress and also this chronic stress if you're going in day in and day out. So being very, very gentle with yourself, being kind to yourself is going to be important. Knowing that you're not alone. Reaching out to people who are fellow travelers is going to be essential because this is not going to be the kind of thing, if you're going in day in and day out, there's going to be stress, okay? So making sure you're taking the precautions that you need to take at home by isolating when you get home, doing all of the disinfecting procedures that you're probably already doing. Noticing also how hard it is if you have to stay separate from your family in your house to make sure that they're safe. That's really important. And see if in the face of all of this, you can find some meaning in doing it, right? So for you, is it important to you to make a difference, to contribute? Because you are, you really are, and it's at cost to yourself. And really noticing that and acknowledging that this hard work that you're doing is to serve all of us. And I mean, I can't express the immense gratitude Right? So you're a part of basically helping us all. You're a part of something much bigger than yourself. I'm noticing that as you go. But I would think self-care, self-kindness, see if you can hold yourself gently. Give yourself some peace. If you can escape a little bit through reading something, watching something on TV, watching, you know, connecting with people who you love, um, those are going to be really important things. I think, as you move through this. I think that's all, you know, really valuable, you know, remembering your purpose and your calling um, mm -hmm. and that you're, you're part of such a huge movement yeah. and, and a, such a, an agent of positive change. That's incredibly important. And a couple things too, like self-care comes in different forms for different people. But one of the things I think people can run into is I have to do everything, you know, and I have to do all of the things. You don't give yourself permission to put stuff down and where you can dial stuff in where you need to leave the laundry undone, you know, let things sit, leave the dishes in the sink. Doesn't matter. 
do the big picture things, let the rest go where you can. That can be one form of self-care in addition to the others that we mentioned. That's, yeah, that's super helpful. Um, so the last question that I have for you is knock on wood, if I get COVID and it's a mild case, whether I am frontline mm. worker or not, how do I balance self-isolation and lowering my family's anxiety by showing them that I'm okay? Is there some sort of balance to breaking self-isolation or rather is, would it be better to show them from a distance that they don't need to be as concerned? How would I be able to ease their concerns that way? I definitely think that um, if it were me in that situation and, you know, I would want to do the same things, like to make sure that my family knew I was okay, or at least let them know that while I was going through this, that I love them and care for them and all of that. So I think that I would stick to doing it as safely as possible within the constraints of your situation. If it's possible, do it on a cell phone, do it via Zoom, FaceTime, um, you know, all of those, you know, really, thank goodness, accessible methods that we may have to communicate like that. Um, if that's not possible, I think be as careful as you can and, you know, take the precautions that are necessary. Um, and again, part of it's going to be, you know, acknowledging that, yeah, this is hard and scary and yeah, I don't feel well. It's, you know, even if you have mild symptoms, which if you do get COVID, I hope that you get mild symptoms. Um, and treat it like you would another, you know, any other kind of illness, like, yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, be open about answering questions, um, and think mindfully developmentally about your kiddo, like, how do you, how will you talk to them based on how old they are, you well, know, and it can be anything from, for younger children, mom and dad are not feeling great, and we love you, and thank you for asking, that means a lot to us, and, you know, we're still here, and we need to rest now, Okay, just like you need a nap, we need a nap right now, you know, to with your teenagers, if they will talk to you about it, um, you know, giving them a little bit more information. So right size the information for your kiddo too. I think that's going to be very important. Awesome. Um, so that was the majority of the questions that the registrants had. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? So I think the only thing I would say is that, you know, just to kind of recap what we've talked about, you know, anxiety and stress during this situation are going to be ubiquitous for all of us. It is harder if you are struggling yourself with, you know, more significant um, symptoms of anxiety and stress. Whether or not you have access to care is another thing that's going to make a big difference. Hold on, all my dogs are now walking into my room, so... So that's Minor distraction. You may hear them. There they are. Yes, the, therapy, right there. the therapy army of dogs has just entered the room here. So um, I think that the main takeaways really are anxiety is a really normal human emotion. And the more we try to struggle with it, I think the bigger it can get. And so using basic tools of present moment awareness noticing your thoughts rather than getting tangled up in them. We call that defusion, right? So not noticing them as realities necessarily, but it's just thoughts that are really scary and hard and come with a physical response and an emotional response as well. Acceptance, again, not of like imagined future fears, right? But that your mind is going to give you that stuff. That's what minds do. You know, that's the downside of having such a brilliant, um, you know, languaging mind that lets us think abstractly. That's important. And then the last thing of checking in with yourself, being kind to yourself, and then noticing what am I up to right now? Am I trying to push something away? Am I struggling with it? Or can I choose something that might be, that might serve me better? Something that's more consistent with the stuff that I most care about right? Because struggling with anxiety in ways that aren't helpful can really pull you up and out of being really connected with your family. And if this time that we're all dealing with is going to be something that is, you know, a part of your family history, 
that you want to remember how you got through it with some fondness, right? And some acknowledgement of the ways you came together, what you did as a family, um, new things you learned about each other and how you all learned to be together in, in this little cult, you know, kind of small space of your home. That's going to be dependent on your ability to connect, right? And so for the pause notice choose, a simple thing you can add to that is, do I want to manage my anxiety or do I want to really work on connecting with my family and supporting them or allowing them to support you? Because we all know asking for help is really hard, right? Because it's a sign of vulnerability, but it isn't. What if it's actually a sign of strength, right? Being able to really acknowledge, like, what are your limits, right? And so I think of this idea of confidence as a clinical psychologist. You know, our ethical code as clinical psychologists requires that we do not work outside of our areas of confidence. And sometimes me, people mistake that, you know, idea of confidence for looking confident instead of being confident, right? So if you want to, up oh, dogs, sorry. Limit of my confidence, managing dogs. Peaches! <laughs> sorry. That's anyway, okay, I just heard like that your dog is named Peaches. <laughs> That is the therapy dog too. So maybe you guys will meet her if you come to McLean at some point. <laughs> anyway, so confidence, true confidence, you know, means knowing what, you're, what you can do and also having a really clear and candid acknowledgement of what you can't, right? So as a parent, this means really noticing and acknowledging what is in your control and what's beyond your control and noticing what is my bandwidth within? I can take care of my own psychological well-being, and what is too much for me, especially if you're a COVID responder, et cetera, right? So kind of thinking carefully about like, and giving yourself permission to put stuff down when you need to is gonna be really important. Okay, none of us are perfect. See, dog, anyway. Well, we'll leave with that. <laughs> I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you to Peaches for being our guest star. <laughs> um, You're welcome. I'm sure she'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> but until then, um, be safe, be healthy, wash your hands. And if you can get outside and enjoy the sunshine wherever you are, do so. So thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Have a great day.